What is going on, everybody? Hope the guys are doing well out there. It is Friday, and I'm finally here for the Fang Stock Recap Show here on the Investor Channel, where every Friday we recap all the major news and the technical chart patterns from all the major Fang Stocks. This week, we got a preview of the new iPhone, which looks exactly like all the ones that have come before it. We had Amazon. You'll be amazed how much Amazon stock went up this week. We had NVIDIA bounce back, and I was on the NVIDIA pump train as the shares that I own are skyrocketing. We also have to look at this technically as well. Also, if you're not a subscriber to the newsletter, I have a new GLP-1 drug newsletter. You're going to want to check this out. Not only talking about Novo Nordisk and Eli Lilly, but all the contenders, all the small companies, mid-sized companies that are a player here. I will continue to update this as more news flows. Links down in the description below for that is completely free. Hopefully you guys enjoy that. Let's not waste any time pumping our other services. Let's kick things off like we always do with Meta Platform. Start the week at 507. Like a lot of these stocks, you're going to be amazed too. When we get to the technical segment, I mean, whoa, we are resilient. There is money in these markets. There was money in Meta this week as the shares went up 3.3% finished the week at 524. Aritza Networks appears likely to be a winner for Meta's mega cluster. This is inside of the data center. So obviously NVIDIA, AMD to a lesser degree, other companies out there are winning in the data center for the GPUs and the actual hardware, but there's this huge networking story as well. In the networking space, you have Arita Networks, which is ticker symbol ANET. You also obviously have Broadcom, probably the granddaddy of them all. You also have Marvell and a handful of, maybe more than a handful of other companies. We'll do just like I did with GLP-1 drugs, expect like a networking, an AI networking kind of overview here very shortly as well. Well, they want a cluster of 100,000 NVIDIA H100s that Meta's got running in the data center. Well, Ritz is going to connect all of those using network, using Ethernet or Ethernet. I've never figured out how to say that word. But what's interesting is, is InfiniBand is just not capable of doing that. And I've read some good research that really companies are going to be using Ethernet as their modus of operanda to connect all of this data center. They're not going to use InfiniBand. They're not going to use NVIDIA's proprietary stuff, at least on the much, much larger clusters which Meta is running. Now, moving over to Apple. Start of the week at 219, up 1.4% after the iPhone maker unveiled its newest iPhone, finished the week at 222.50. Now, showed off its AI-packed iPhone. What was interesting, though, and I'm sure most of you guys saw this, is that the phone is actually not going to be shipping with the AI software that is going to come later in the fall. So you're going to be able to buy your iPhones, my guess is maybe starting next week or so. I do have the B-roll. Looks like available starting on the 20th. 20th, and it says Apple intelligence coming this fall. So I thought that was interesting that they're actually selling these phones without probably the only feature that is worth it. Now, I'm pretty sure all phones made after a certain date are going to be able to run Apple intelligence. So you're not going to need these new phones. This is a minor upgrade as been the case with Apple for some time. Now you get slightly thinner bezels. The camera certainly is maybe slightly noticeably better. They've got a few extra colors and a few extra bells and whistles. If you're in the market for a new phone, that's probably one of your best options. But people like me who has a phone maybe two or three years old, am I going to be running out to spend $1,000? Probably not unless my phone actually breaks. Now, changes inside of the iPhone 16 will aid companies like Qualcomm, Broadcom, and others. Although I would hesitate to buy a company just because it supplies Apple. That is because Apple squeezes the neck, particularly of smaller suppliers like this Sirius Logic. Now, over the past year, shares have done beautifully, up over 84%, certainly exceeding the performance of Apple. But in the long run, I'd probably rather own Apple shares now. Huawei, excuse me. Did I say that right? I think I said Huawei might be the way to say it. I say it like the white boy American way. Somebody did correct me in the comments, and I do appreciate that. As I think I've said here on the channel before, my dad is from the East Coast. My mom is from the West Coast. So you get kind of a blurring of language and speech here on the investor channel. Well, they rolled out the ultimate design. It's a trifold. I don't know if you can see this here on the screen. It is a trifold phone. So I thought this was interesting. Looks really nice. Actually, the engineering of this phone looks absolutely fantastic. I don't think I'll ever be able to get to buy one or hold one in my hand, 
but this looks really, really cool. My guess is you'll probably have copycats here in the United States, maybe potentially from Samsung, maybe potentially from Google as well. But this is an interesting design. And, and my guess is this company has been taking market share. It's, uh, it's a fact. They've been taking market share away from Apple in the country of China. I think a design like this probably will just continue that because Apple's design, like I said, is exactly like the previous phone. Now, we did see a little bit of innovation this Monday from Apple in that they released new AirPods, which are, you know, look, largely the same as previous ones. Now, the price doesn't seem wildly egregious at $129 with $179 if you want some noise cancellation. You got to pay $50 to cancel out the noise these days with Apple, but they act as hearing aids. And what's interesting is I, I don't know if any of you have siblings or parents or maybe even you wear hearing aids. The hearing aid market is so crazy. You go in for some hearing aids and they can be thousands, thousands and thousands of dollars. So this will be an interesting market for Apple if they can prove that these AirPods actually work, not necessarily for people that are seriously deaf, but maybe obviously your hearing starts to go as you get older. And if you were like me and you've gone to concerts and stuff like that, your hearing just naturally is degraded. Well, if these things can actually serve as kind of low cost hearing aids, I'll put that in air quotes because $129 to $179 would be a very low cost hearing aid. Well, maybe Apple picks up some new customers. Now, the company needed FDA approval on the software to use AirPods as hearing aids, and they got that. So they're going to be able to advertise these as actual hearing aids. So I thought that was interesting. Now, got an interesting comment on Twitter. Links are always down in the description below to X, Instagram, LinkedIn. Please visit those links down below. Follow me over there. Those are great places to connect with me. Now, the company must pay a 13 billion euro in back taxes. This is according to an EU top court. Now, Apple continues to claim that they paid all their taxes. They don't know why they have to go back and pay even more. <laughs> Look, I tend to agree with them. I doubt Apple was skipping out on some taxes. But what the court says and what the government says, you've got to pay. What's interesting is this money was in escrow. And so Apple has had this money set aside, but we will notice when we do their fourth quarter video likely in a month or two they will recognize an actual one-time charge for about 10 billion dollars it will show up on the income tax side on the profit and loss statement so that'll be interesting maybe they'll subtract it out on cash flows because this was already set in escrow i'm not a cpa i don't know how this money is really accounted for my guess is this money was in escrow and so it was recognized somewhere on the balance sheet potentially as a liability so it will impact the EPS to a certain degree because $10 billion even to Apple will knock that down a little bit. My guess is investors will look past that. Now, moving on to Amazon. Like I said at the jump, I actually had a double take on this. Start of the week at 174. And as you'll see here, not on a ton of news, nothing groundbreaking, although the Oracle deal was interesting for Amazon, but shares were up 6.7% to finish the week. At $186, guys, a big $2 trillion company going up nearly 7% in a week where there was no earnings. Thought that was interesting. Now, U.S. is going to finalize tariff hikes on Chinese goods. Many are going to start September 27th. No, don't check your calendar. Don't check who's in the Oval Office. It is not former President Trump putting on these tariffs. It is actually the Biden administration. Many of the tariffs that President Trump put into place are still in place. And in fact, they are increasing. In fact, some might even argue, and I think I've seen some data on, there's actually more tariffs been put in place under the Biden administration than under the Trump administration. And so the irony there is relatively thick since I think the former president continues to take flack for saying he's going to levy these tariffs Again, with politics, always it's about what the candidates do, not what they say, not what the media says. So here we are with a bunch of tariffs that obviously will impact goods heading onto Amazon, but it does benefit domestic firms. So some of that can offset. Now, Amazon is going to boost investment in their delivery service program. 
They obviously continue to do that as those vans that drive around your neighborhood, those Amazon vans, those are actually something called the Deliver Service Program or Delivery Service Partner Program, very similar to how FedEx runs. FedEx is a parent company. They're not like UPS, which has a bunch of union labor and wholly owned vans and trucks and then the labor as well. FedEx is actually kind of a, maybe like a franchise model where an individual business owner owns the franchise that then uses the FedEx brand to deliver packages. FedEx owns maybe the large hubs and the networks that they send the packages to, but then third parties go in FedEx trucks and actually pick them up and deliver to the door. Amazon has done the same thing, but they continue to invest in it with $2.1 billion trying to back those partners in those business. Now, Oracle popped earlier this week along with Amazon as they are going to unveil their very popular, still very popular database solution on Amazon and Google. That led to Amazon shares going up, but I don't think that could account for a 6% rise. So I think there's some stuff going on in the background, maybe some insider stuff that we're not aware of that might become apparent later for Amazon. Now, the CEO still sees a massive opportunity to expand its cloud services operating with the CEO basically saying that many enterprises out there are still housing a lot of their data workloads on premise and that maybe only 15 to 20 percent have moved to the cloud. And obviously that last 60 or 70 percent, some of it maybe like healthcare and some of these kind of data sensitive things, they may never move to the cloud or the traditional cloud, but there's probably still a lot of business for Amazon and obviously they'll gobble up a lot of that. Now, moving on to Netflix start of the week at 678 and on the week that selling sunset premiered Netflix shares were up 2.7 percent finished at 697 I literally don't watch any network tv I don't watch any sitcoms I really don't watch a lot of movies but whenever selling sunset premieres I sit there and I binge watch it it's about as fast as I can. Not a lot of news out of Netflix other than that. Moving on to the big boy, NVIDIA. Start of the week at 106. And as this thing climbed all week, I was pumped. Because as most of you might have realized or I mentioned on a show, I, for some, whatever reason, I took out a big position in NVIDIA after earnings. And I, and I kind of chunked into it because the shares kept going down. And so for some reason, I have a big position in NVIDIA. And so you can imagine it was a good week when it was up. 12%. I shaved off a little bit, but I'm I'm letting it ride, baby. We are still in Nvidia and the CEO said that they have a 1 trillion opportunity and this is something that he's repeated himself on multiple times. This was interesting about the Nvidia news this week. The shares really started to climb. You actually can see it here. The shares were at $110 and they climbed $9 over the next couple of days, really on the back that Jensen Wong appeared, I believe it was a JP Morgan and maybe a Goldman Sachs conference, but repeated something that he said on conference calls and at Computex. So it's really interesting. We as investors think, oh, all this information's out there. All the investors know it. But actually, that's not true. Jensen Wong can say, hey, we have a trillion dollar data center opportunity. And there's some investors that are still either catching on or maybe didn't believe them the first time and are maybe believing it even more. Now, the U.S. is still considering some NVIDIA chip exports. That is in the country of Saudi Arabia. They obviously have pretty heavy export restrictions into China, certainly Russia as well. Taiwan Semiconductor's August sales, this also could have surged NVIDIA, other chip stocks as well. We'll talk about this weekend on the chip show, but their August sales surge as they continue to point to demand. Now, all of this points, and this is something that we've talked multiple weeks here on the semiconductor show links down in the description to our second channel that show airs usually on Saturdays or Sunday. One thing that we've talked about two Saturdays or two, two weekends in a row is the fact when you look forward on Nvidia's earnings estimates, it is absolutely extraordinary. It is actually something that I've never, ever, ever seen for a company of this size. Do you see it on smaller companies, lesser covered companies? Of course, sometimes you get a big deviation in terms of analyst estimates. I've never seen it on a company valued at, that is Netflix valued at 200 billion. We're talking about a $3 trillion company. When you look out just a couple of quarters into Q3 of next year, which is basically a year from now, some analysts think NVIDIA is going to do $32 billion in revenue. 
Some analysts think they're going to do $57 billion in revenue. That is a gap of $20 billion. We're not talking about $20 billion in a year. We're talking about $20 billion in a quarter. $20 billion in a quarter is what AMD does for a whole year. So we're talking about a whole years of AMD's revenue as the discrepancy between the high and the low end estimate for NVIDIA. A quarter out from that, again, about a year from now, you're looking at 25 to maybe as high as $80 billion in revenue. Wall Street cannot figure out where NVIDIA's revenue is gonna come in in the coming months ahead. They don't know if it's gonna come in towards the midpoint, towards the low end, 30, $40 billion. Some think it might be 50, 60, $70 billion. Well, Jensen Wong getting on the stage and basically reaffirming a $1 trillion opportunity is there. You also have Taiwan Semiconductor saying that August sales have surged. Start connecting the dots, folks, and you can probably imagine which side NVIDIA is going to fall on. And when Wall Street has this big of a gap, it will begin to close. And if it closes towards the high end, well, shares of NVIDIA at $119 will probably look relatively cheap. Now, moving, oh, now that I've just pumped the trade that I put on from both a fundamental and a, really more fundamentally than technically. Moving over to Google, start of the week at $153 and some change. Oh, we'll call that up 3% to finish the week at $157 and some change. Now, the top EU court is rejecting Google's appeal against a $2.4 billion fine in a shopping e-commerce case. Now, this doesn't impact Google really much at all. $2.4 billion to you and I, we are absolutely getting on that G5 and we are going to the Cosmopolitan or the Aria, maybe even the Vidara if we wanna be a little more low key in Las Vegas. But to Google, $2.4 billion or 2.4 billion euro, which is I think more or less the same, not going to impact the company much, not like Apple, where $10 billion, at least recognized in a single quarter, does move the needle. We talked about this with Amazon as they formed a new partnership with Oracle. Should bring a couple of people over to Google, not necessarily a big jump, but gives them another offering, particularly on that database size, which I think some of the complaint for Google has been. Now, a DOJ prosecutor is saying Google's tried to control all aspect of online tech at a trial opening. So Google's in the midst of another antitrust, or at least this is a Department of Justice trial. Those are probably two separate things. But the company is now battling the government based on its ad tech. And as most of you probably know, Google controls the entire ad bidding process end to end. As somebody who's spent multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars, I might even be into the millions of dollars that I've spent on online ads over the past, uh, more than over the past uh, decade, it's probably been about 12, 13 years that I've been, Google calls me literally every day to try, like literally every single day to try to get me to buy more ads. That is how many ads I bought. I think it is one of the most untra untransparent things I've ever been a part of. They control the platform, they control the bidding, they give you no insight into the auction. They give you a little bit more insight than they did in the past, but you don't you don't have any trust there since it's not a third party. Google could tell me Amazon is bidding 19 cents or $1.90 on this keyword, and I basically have to keep their word for it or take their word for it. So I can see the Department of Justice point here. And so Google though, look, Google internally at the company, there should be no one surprised that they wanna basically just crush everybody and control every online tech business. That is their job for you as a company and as a shareholder. So I applaud Google, but at the same time, I am in this case sympathetic to the GOJ's case because I actually think they have one here. Now, also in the trial, they're showing notes from former Google executives that show exactly what you wanna see if you're an investor in the company. They wanted to quote, crush rivals. If I'm going to buy shares in a company that I have no really any significant voting control, I have no operation control. I'm basically just giving them money and hoping they do their best. Well, yeah, I hope the executives that are earning salary are looking to crush rivals. When you're rooting for a basketball team, you're hoping your team crushes the other team. When you invest money into Google, you're hoping they crush other people. But when these things come out in a courtroom, 
It might not be the best look. Now, Google's cloud CEO details path of monetization for AI. So these companies are starting to lay these types of things out. Most of it happens to be on the Google cloud side. They've said that they've seen a 10 times growth year over year on people using their AI clusters. I think what people are looking for though is that like piece of software, that open AI kind of $20 a month or that Microsoft 365 kind of $5 a month type of charge. Or maybe it's, it's obviously higher than that from the enterprise perspective. That's what they're looking for. With the Google Cloud numbers, we can see they generate about a billion dollars of operating income in a quarter. For a year, Google's gonna make five to six billion dollars on the upside in Google Cloud. But we're talking about a company worth well north of a trillion dollars, two trillion dollars, and a company that has an ad business that I think is multiple hundreds of billions of dollars. So to move the needle, for AI to move the needle at Google, we need to be talking about tens of billions of dollars, not just in revenue, but also profits. Moving on to Microsoft, start of the week at 408 up. Well, this one was up big too. Technically, you're going to love this. Up five and a half percent to finish the week at 430.59. Now, open AI. They're not sitting around waiting for other companies to innovate. They're trying to do it too. And they unveiled a series of AI models capable of reasoning. They rolled these out to, I think, all premium users. I still have a premium subscription to OpenAI. I'll jump on there and try to test these out. I tried to test these out before this video, but I didn't really see them available. It's saying that they can reason through complex tasks, solve harder problems and models, science and coding, and certainly math has been kind of a lacking capability of these models. I'll put it through the paces. I'll look at what other people that are really kind of experts at putting these things through the paces. There's certainly some good newsletters, some people on X and stuff that report on this type of thing. And we'll talk about it probably on a future show. Now, OpenAI is doing this as they are in talks to raise $6.555 billion for a $150 billion valuation. That would make Microsoft stake, which they're going to have to really write up on their balance sheet. I don't know how they recognize that. But holy crap, that doubles the valuation that they received just earlier this year. So this company is moving fast. We'll see if they can raise the 6.5. My guess is they can raise the 6.5. It'll be, can they do it at $150 million valuation? We reported on earlier weeks that Apple and NVIDIA could potentially be involved in this round of fundraising. Now, CrowdStrike's CEO is, look, I mean, look, CrowdStrike's stock, it took a big tumble, but it certainly has found some footing. And he said there was, quote, misinformation. He sounds like one of these people that works for the government by competitors on the outage update. Look, CrowdStrike, your software didn't work. It caused some problems. Just own it and tell us what we're doing. Says they're going to meet with Microsoft on resiliency. I don't like the CEO hiding behind misinformation if your thing worked flawlessly there would have been no opportunity for misinformation now the company look we're, we're making tons of money over at microsoft we got a three trillion dollar valuation but we're going to trim 650 jobs over at xbox my guess some of these probably carried over from activision blizzard as you'd expect maybe some carryover and some people losing some jobs there we hope they can land on their feet now the cto is hinting that a new super important AI product is emerging. This is the Microsoft CTO. I don't think he was referring to the news that we saw this week from OpenAI. This was also at a Goldman Sachs conference, which I believe also Jensen Wong was speaking at as well. He's basically saying they probably got some new large language model cooking up in the background. Because if you are familiar with the agreement that Microsoft has with OpenAI, once the board of directors at OpenAI concludes that OpenAI has achieved AGI or artificial general intelligence, well, their exclusive agreement with Microsoft is over and Microsoft does not get access to that quote AGI model, they would get access to the previous model, whether it's GPT-4, GPT-4.0, or 5, 6, 12, whatever that is. So if OpenAI achieves AGI in the next year, Microsoft is sitting back and they basically would have to renegotiate a licensing deal to, for access to that model, just like every other company out there would likely be wanting to do. So Microsoft's not gonna sit on their loyals. They got plenty of compute power. They are trying to develop these models themselves and we'll see if their model can at least match, but will be more interesting is if Microsoft is the one that kills OpenAI and not Google and not Anthropic or not any of these other companies, what if Microsoft is the one that actually kills OpenAI? Not saying that's gonna happen, but Microsoft, while they're a partner of OpenAI, is also a competitor. Now, Microsoft's financial changes 
should provide a cleaner look into Azure. This is according to Morgan Stanley. You might recall a couple of weeks ago, we noticed or we reported on the fact that Microsoft is changing the way they report some metrics and segments of their businesses. They group things, I think, into three different segments. You have like computing, you have professional, and you have basically Azure that gets lumped in somewhere else. Morgan Stanley is saying that now we're going to get a cleaner look at Azure. My guess is because the business has gotten so big, at some point the SEC requires you to make these changes. This is not my, Microsoft would love to hide the Azure numbers in some big basket of revenue for as long as they possibly can. They don't really want competitors seeing that. Same thing with Amazon. Amazon would love to just lump all their Amazon AWS revenue into one basket and never show it to anybody and basically say, this is our revenue. It's some e-commerce. It's some AWS. You have to figure that out for yourself. But what happens is the SEC actually forces these companies to start breaking these figures out. And I think that's what is happening there. Moving over to Tesla. Start of the week at 2.8. And Tesla's popping, guys, of 5.5%. Is it 10.10 yet? No, we're about a month away from that big reveal we talked about last week. They are renting out a Hollywood studio. I mean, Elon Musk is going all in on this robo taxi reveal. And I think shares of Tesla probably trade upwards into that. It's probably going to be a sell the news type of event but I'll let you make the decision if you want to do that. Now, Tesla sees some lower estimates on their Q3 deliveries and their EPS as the monthly numbers from China came in more recently or at least two weeks ago. And the estimates continue to come in, at least on the demand side for cars. Anybody out there shopping for cars can just see that the pricing and certainly the incentives continue to go lower and lower. I may or may not have been on Mercedes website this week looking at cars, not saying I'm going to buy one, but... I tell you what, the pricing is getting a lot more attractive. Now, stocks that would be the most impacted by Trump's proposed tariff increases, I don't actually think it would be Tesla. Now, they might have it listed here, but the fact is the vast majority of Tesla's car is actually made here in the United States. Now, they say Tesla is one of them. I would argue that other companies like Nike, like Ross, like Lululemon, these companies certainly, Apple as well, where they rely almost exclusively on China to a lesser degree maybe before than before the pandemic, but most of these companies are still relying heavily on China not only to manufacture the good, But even companies like Nike continue to count on them from a revenue standpoint. I think the same could be said for Tesla, but I don't think that's necessarily tariff related. Now, if you start connecting the dots and that Trump's preferred tariffs could create an opportunity for China to strike back and maybe against American companies. Just remember, just remember, Barclays is probably politically on one side or the other. Just remember that the Biden administration has kept almost all of the tariffs that Trump put into place. And in fact, they've put even more in place. And I showed you a press release earlier that they're going to jack up the price even more on those tariffs. So it, it, these are not Trump's proposed tariffs. These are the United States tariffs. And they are still in place. And they are not going away anytime soon. Now, oh my gosh, guys, we've got a technical segment for one to remember. Do we have, I saw some people on social media being like, we have a double top and look, I I am not a technical chart master. Maybe this is common in a double top formation where you come back up and back test the double top and then you get the flush out. Whether or not that happens, I don't know, but it looks like to me, you are on the momentum to make a new higher high because you just confirmed another higher low, which has been going on for Uh, Over two years in the stock market, basically, or almost two years. You just confirmed a new higher low. This one looks like to me you've got some legs and you're going to make a new higher high next week. That would cancel out any kind of double top talk. Now, Meta confirmed a new higher high just a couple of weeks ago. Has found some footing at this area. We still like this one lower. I would still wait on Meta. Got earnings still more than a month away. As I see here, sometime likely in the third week, most of these companies will be reporting earnings. Now, Apple reported their new iPhone 16 this week and didn't do a whole lot to the shares. You still have lower highs, but the stock is consolidating in this 210 to 230 range until you break solidly one way or the other on this one. There's not a lot there, honestly, technically. Now, Amazon, we kept this channel line. So this channel with the red line, light green line, we can take this darker green line off, at least temporarily. And finally, kind of a black line on the bottom. 
We kept this in place after earnings because we had a gap down through the trend, but we back tested to it very quickly. So I think I remember saying, well, let's keep this on because what happens sometimes is we claw our way back into trend. And this thing is like a black hole or think of like a, a vacuum cleaner. Okay. This channel line is like a vacuum cleaner. And when you break below trend, what is going to happen is price. And in this case, shareholders are going to want to suck this back into trend. And that's more or less what we've seen with Amazon. And so we're back into trend with Amazon. Trend is still in place. And here you are with Amazon. As you approach the middle of the channel, if you were wanting to take profits, maybe you were one of these dip buyers on Amazon. Well, we often say the middle of the channels can be accumulation point. That's after you touch the top and you work your way back. On the way back through, the middle of the channel can serve as resistance. You see here, multiple times, the middle of the channel is actually served as kind of a resistance point. So you can take profits on Amazon as you work your way back into the middle of the channel. This one looks like to me, it wants to get back into $200 territory. Netflix continues to trade and hover at the highs. This company is usually one of the first to report their earnings. We'll hear from them in the middle of next month. So we're about 30 days away. 15th of October should be the second week of October. We'll hear from Netflix. Will that be enough to send the stock higher? If it sets up at this level, there'll be a high bar that Netflix will have to cross. But in the space that they're in, they are absolutely crushing it. Now, Google had made its way back into really this channel that had been relatively well-defined. I'll highlight it here kind of with black lines, but we've had the triple green line on this one. As you pull back into this one, it was a buying opportunity. It did almost reach kind of the middle of the channel. Again, middle of the channels can always be buying opportunities. In fact, this black line should be pushed up a little bit higher. This channel is a little tighter. This one looks pretty good to me. We're retesting the top of the channel, but you could break out from this one. Certainly positive results from their trial could send that one even higher. Now, moving over to Microsoft, this one had bounced off the lows here and was hovering more or less in a buy zone. It is making its way back up to the middle of the channel. As you approach 450 on Microsoft, that could be some profit taking. And Microsoft's looking great from a technical perspective. I can see why the markets are moving because these stocks look great. I noticed that I skipped NVIDIA because I moved it around for our semiconductor show. I'll get to that one in a minute. Tesla also still looking great. It's a weird, weird pattern, but we are still making a series of higher lows here. And if we make a new higher high, which is, I think is possible heading into that 10, 10, October 10th event. Well, yeah, you'd push into the two seventies, two eighties, two nineties on this one. Now let's slide down to Nvidia. My apologies. I normally catch sliding it in here. You are still making lower highs on this one, but you are very tightly consolidating, and this is more or less what I'm playing, at least from a short-term perspective, trade on this one. You are consolidating between these two areas. NVIDIA really since May of this year has not gone significantly below 93, 95. You could even bump this up to close to $100 per share, and it has not been able to eclipse $130 per share or $140 per share. You would like to see it push higher, retest these areas. It doesn't have to make necessarily a new higher high, but I am peeled off some of the trade that I have on now, and I'm gonna peel off more into next week if we continue to work our way uh, into the 130s, 140s, and I'll let maybe potentially the rest ride. Because obviously, as you know, the fundamentals with NVIDIA are so wide from a revenue estimate perspective. If NVIDIA can come in towards the high-end revenue, there's very few companies in the world that can put up 60, 70, 80 billion dollars of quarterly revenue at 70% gross margins. If NVIDIA does that, then it actually legitimately has a shot this time next year actually being the most valuable company in the world. Folks, that was the Fang Stock recap show for Friday. It was Friday the 13th today. Friday, September 13th. Have a safe one. Stay away from the ladders and the black cats, and we'll be back later next week. Check out our newsletter if you're interested in GLP-1 weight loss drugs. I basically have the entire industry, at least the ones that have therapeutics that are set to go to market over the next three or four years here. I have it outlined here for you. If you're curious on that, links are down in the description below. We'll see you again next week. Good luck with your investments.